Welcome to Peace Week, organized by the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Sorry, my notes just it got bigger. There we go. Each semester, Carter School Peace Week brings together faculty, students, and alumni, as well as friends and partners from across the peace and conflict resolution community for a week-long conversation around how to effectively address urgent issues of peace and justice. There are many wonderful events throughout the week, and since it is only Tuesday, you can find the entire schedule and register for additional events by going to carterschool.gmu.edu. The theme for this semester's Peace Week is Ideas and Action, Integrating Theory and Practice for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Our session is titled The Historic Peace Churches, Integrating Theology and Practice for Peace Building. And we're playing a bit with the idea of theology as theory, and also because it has a lot of the same letters and I like words and how that has manifest in the practice of these unique faith traditions, which have come to be known for both their active and often cooperative peace building activity, and in many ways have claimed that identity historically and in the present. We also hope to hear some ideas in this session about how the historic peace churches envision carrying this integration of theology and practice into the future of peace building. Charles and our panelists will talk more about this in a few minutes. Also, George Mason University is celebrating their 50th anniversary, and you can learn more about the university and the anniversary events by visiting the university's website, gmu.edu. Charles and I are facilitating the session today. We are both doctoral students at the Carter School at George Mason, and we connected through our shared interests and work in our respective historic peace church traditions. Charles and I will each introduce ourselves and then share some opening thoughts before we move into hearing from our panelists. We will introduce each panelist as they present. We structured this session so that we should have a good amount of time after presentations for discussion and questions. So if you have thoughts or questions as we go along, feel free to write them in the chat window or jot down a note for yourself and we will engage in conversation after all of the panelists have shared. In the meantime, it is most helpful if all participants can keep their microphones muted other than the speaker. Charles, would you like to give just a very brief personal introduction? Thank you, Naomi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Quellum, and as Naomi rightly mentioned, I am a doctoral student at the Carter School. And then also, I am a research affiliate to uh, the Better Evidence Project, and then uh, the Transforming for Mind, uh, the Transforming the Mind for Peace project as well. And today I am actually putting on double hat in the sense that, um, aside from being a doctoral student, uh, I am also the Senior Peace Education and Advocacy Associate International for the National Peace and Justice Ministries of Mennonite Central Committee, and uh, my office is actually based at the Washington DC office. Thanks, Naomi. Over to you. Thank you. And my name is Naomi Cranebring, and I am joining you today from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. This is my second year in the doctoral program at George Mason. I'm an ordained minister in the Church of the Brethren, and I teach as an adjunct faculty member, <clears throat> excuse me, ad adjunct faculty member in religious studies at Elizabethtown College. Most of my work has been in lay leadership positions in local congregations, and now primarily as an instructor at the college. I'm a graduate of Bethany Theological Seminary in Richmond, Indiana, and I'm also an alum of Elizabethtown College. And I live with my spouse, Mark, and our four children, ages 12 through 20 in Mannheim, Pennsylvania. I am particularly passionate about interfaith peace building and ecumenical relationships. And my current research is focused on Lancaster County as a receiving community for refugees, with particular attention to how the religious identity of this place might be a foundational part of that welcoming activity. So thank you all for being here today. This is very exciting. Um, and I'm aware that some that we have joining us are deeply invested in one or more of these religious traditions. And I'm also aware that we have some joining us who may be quite unfamiliar with the historic peace churches. So I wanna give just a very brief kind of orientation so that we have some shared understanding moving forward. And I will admit to a brethren bias based in my own involvement with the Church of the Brethren tradition. 
And this will be even more evident as I am going to utilize my grandfather's copy of the Brethren Encyclopedia to begin to define who the historic peace churches are. And I chose the word who very intentionally here, highlighting the theological importance of people in these Christian traditions. So the historic peace churches, a name coined in 1935 to designate the brethren, friends, and Mennonites as those sharing a witness against war. Though emerging in different eras, Mennonites from the radical reformation of the 16th century, Society of Friends from, the radical, from radical Puritanism in the 17th century, and Brethren from Radical Pietism in the 18th century, all have held consistent peace positions. This often brought them into cooperative relationships, especially during wartime, but also in programs of relief, reconstruction, and social amelioration. The Brethren and Mennonites found a shared place of safety and tolerance in their settlement in Pennsylvania, a colony founded by Quakers. All three groups were escaping religious persecution, although it was not entirely to be escaped as persecution continued to play out at times on North American soil as well in a variety of forms. There was both interrelationship and sometimes tension between these groups as they sought to define themselves in a new social milieu. World War I came as a bit of surprise and the Brethren, Quaker and Mennonite peace positions were put to the test with little advanced preparation. The three groups were involved in several conferences of pacifist churches during the 1920s and 1930s. And in 1935 in Newton, Kansas, the language historic peace churches was used found to be more palatable than the word pacifist for some. In more recent decades, these traditions have been an important voice in the World Council of Churches to bring attention and action to issues of peace and nonviolence. We could host an entire session just discussing, or I think we could anyway, just discussing the unique and overlapping history and theology of these three groups. But I wanna focus on just three specific theological concepts that I see that are shared and relevant to this conversation. First is an opposition to war and violence. This became evident as early as the American Revolution and Civil War when Brethren, Mennonites, and Quakers were united in their opposition to military activity and attempted to pursue options that would release them from their obligation to participate. This activity eventually led to official US policy in the 1950s, allowing for conscientious objection and also to alternative service options, which had been initiated by the American Friends Service Committee as early as 1917. Second, faith and peace in action. Theology is evident in faith practice in a variety of ways through these traditions, including disaster relief, peace witness and activism, care for the oppressed and marginalized, and peace training and education. And you will hear more about these and other examples from our panelists shortly. Finally, individual variation. Most of what I have shared up to this point has been a sweeping characterization of these three traditions or denominations as a whole, but it is important to identify that there is individual variation and a range of personal responses among persons who identify as part of these traditions. Some of this is related to the shared respect for and value of conscience and conviction, especially as individuals embedded in communities hear and interpret the sacred text and the spirit of God. This concept both inspires the shared peace movement, but also can create tension between consciences and prompt calls for forbearance. Understandings of what makes the way for peace have resulted in a variety of actions, including refusal to register for the military when required by law, participation in voluntary, volunteer non-military service as an alternative to conscription, military service in non-combatant roles, and some have chosen full enlistment and military service, both during times of draft and during times of peace. Charles, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Nomi, for this historical background and overview. Um, let me just begin by acknowledging and affirming that our identity as historic churches, and especially also as Mennonites, for example, remains intrinsically intertwined and reflected in our values. It is surely the same with 
other historic peace heritages. So as we reflect on how our biblically rooted peace theology constantly interacts and manifests in our nonviolent peacemaking practices, it is very, very prominent to visualize the relationship building that emerges. And this emerges in these metrics. We know that, for example, that they are intertwined in epistemologies, ideologies, scholarships, and values. And most importantly, I would add that also for those whom we mutually and selflessly respond to in accompaniment. Uh, this for me is a reminder that the world is a community and as one family, it should be pivoted on the love that comes from the divine cause of existence. It is a call for an epistemological collaboration. Uh, quickly, let me just connect the metrics and to say that uh, there are several trends which we see. And these trends are the constant change of dynamics in the world. As conflict dynamics change, we become, they become more complex, this we know. And then as well, they intertwine with structures in systems requiring a constant renewal or an adjournment as a Latin and we say of the methods and approaches in order to confront and transform these conflict dynamics. These are realities. Therefore, we continue to navigate and negotiate relationships between our faith experience, religious and spiritual, as well as the sociocultural experience and our epistemology, our knowledge, and then even our ethics, our ways of living. We, we negotiate constantly and interact with the society. It is absolutely necessary. And that is the reason why there is this other trend, the pluralistic character of our society. So we know that diversity is God's design and multiplicity and pluralistic nature of, the, of, of world viewing and perspectives, especially in the ways that the society responds to conflict and violence necessitates a sustainable interaction amongst scholarships, disciplines, and fields of learning, and especially even theology, for example, in order to constantly examine and re-examine existing ideologies as our values translate into our practice of nonviolence and peace making. And then also the third trend is the fact of our ontological responsibility. Our ministry as, our ministry as Mennonites, for example, or Anabaptists and living our ontological responsibility as peacemakers, because we are called to peacemaking, justice seeking and compassion for all. And these are aimed to transforming our relationship with God, communities with one another, and then also with creation. And this is the matrix of reconciliation. Our response is not limited by border, creed, color, race, nationality, ideology, or class. And it is encapsulated in, in the principle and practice of human dignity, which is reflected in the Imago Dei principle. The Imago Dei is the Latin word for the image of God. And then also the last trend that I would want to connect our metrics to is the idea of incorporating the relationship between our theology and practice and especially peace practice. So it is a process actually, and it is actively continuous. Our peace practice is nested within integrated peace programming and, and, the, whole, and the whole sphere of, of humanitarian principles. Now, the peace practice that I want to refer to here and anchor on is advocacy because I do US, uh, US public policy advocacy. And so from from the Mennonite tradition, our form of advocacy, for example, is referred to reflective advocacy. And we respond to the well being of people globally and the healing of creation, especially vulnerable communities, by interacting with policymakers, governments, and officials at the same time, and then aiming to transform contents of policies for the common good. And that is the reason, and that is the reason why. We work to incorporate our identity and values, which is our axiology, from 
human stories and experiences from the field, the places where we work. And then when we collect these stories, we approach policymakers and governments in order to make sure that these stories and the morale of the stories are actually incorporated in the drafting of these policies in such a way that humanitarianism, development, and peace policies are meant for the common good. So transformative change involves work at all multiple levels. This we know. But for these changes to become realistic, then we would have to enforce a, a transformational change in social, in social political policies. And this will, in fact, change those factors that tend to impede our effort of peacemaking, justice seeking, and then at the same time, compassion for all. Through strategic and reflective um, advocacy, for example, which is dignity centered, power is shared between us and those whom we work with in such a way that MCC speaks truth to power, for example, motivating the agency of actors with capacities to change and coordinate with local partners to collaborate, influence structures and systems, both locally and internationally. And finally, I would say that our identity and values, which are informed by our theology, for example, are reflected in nonviolent peace education and nonviolent peace building initiatives, which we advocate, such as, for example, the peace clubs. The peace clubs, for example, aims to transform the mindsets of youth against all forms of bias, violence, hatred, and to cultivate trust building, positive attitudes, and mutual relationships. Having connected these metrics and these emerging trends, I believe that the discussions today will enflesh on these perspectives. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Charles. So we will proceed with uh, our panelists and we will introduce them each uh, as they prepare to speak. Uh, Charles, I believe you are going to introduce Gloria. Charles, you're muted, sorry. Oh, sorry. Gloria Rhodes is an Associate Professor of Peacebuilding and Conflict Studies at Eastern Mennonite University. As a faculty member at the Center for Justice and Peace Building, she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in conflict and peace building theory, personal formation for peace building practice, and conflict analysis. Additional areas of interest for Gloria Roots include peace building curriculum and pedagogy, practice related research, group facilitation and mediation, Enneagram training and cross-cultural education. In fact, she holds a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mercer University. Rhodes was born into, was raised in, and remains an active member of the Mennonite Church. Gloria, you're welcome. Thank you, Charles. Um, you said so many important things and helpful things as a a foundation for uh, everything that I that I would add, and so I'm just going to give uh, some examples um, of my program coming from my program at Eastern Mennonite University. The Center for Justice and Peace Building is where I teach primarily um, because uh, we host uh, three graduate programs. I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, both Naomi and Charles talked about the historic peace churches as really motivated to do something about the problems of the world, the problems of poverty, the problems of conflict, of violence, of injustice. And so um, the question is then uh, how do we do and what do we do about education? So coming uh, from a graduate program perspective. And so for 
us at our program, one of the, the things that being faith-based means is that we have a foundation in our theology and Christian scripture that we can start with for our values. And so things that have already been named, values for nonviolence, the primacy of relationships as the way to contribute to positive social change, um, this idea of discipleship, which is following or doing things the way that Jesus modeled in his life, for example, living simply and uh, stu with stewardship, stewarding resources. So I can't name all of them, I'm not going to do that, but I know others will be talking about some of, more of Mennonite theology. So I just wanna use uh, two, I was gonna say one, but um, I was given an extra half a minute. So I'm gonna say two scriptural references that uh, for me um, are sort of central to how we, how we teach and what we put as priority in our, in our programs. The first one is uh, from Romans 12.20, and um, many of you historic Peace Church folks will uh, know this one well. I put it in the chat. It's uh, around, uh, it's responding to the question of, you know, how do we, how do we live well as Christians? And um, the, the, the response here is, it's not about burning, you know, doing burnt offerings or sacrificing our firstborn. It's, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. If, uh, and in so doing, you'll keep burning coals on their head. Do not overcome evil, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so I sometimes I joke that this is where Mennonites get the value of passive aggression, but uh, in reality, um, it's a model of saying, um, okay, we can laugh at ourselves too, but it's a model of, um, of, of the doing that I was taught that we've been talking about. I'll do, I use another verse that's, um, also meaningful to lots of, of um, Anabaptists and Mennonites and the rest of us. Um, that, and that is um, Micah 6, 8. And that one is also coming in the chat, maybe. Um, my, plus my notes. Um, what do we need to be, do as Christians? What does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God? And so in a lot of ways, our programs here at EMU have been uh, organized to do those things. And I chose that verse because I think we are doers. I think us in the Peace Church, is, like I said, are doers. And this stance of doing justice, loving kindness, or mercy, some places it talks about, or walking humbly. It's foundational to how we do education for peace and peacemaking or peace building as well. So this focus on doing actually helps us to, to name some of our distinctives among all these graduate programs that we have for peace and conflict studies that exist in the field. And so we talk about um, this emphasis on doing as a focus on practice. And uh, while we teach, of course, with theory and research, but our niche, so to speak, is on practice, practical um, applications. How do we do this work of peace building? Uh, and so, for example, with this, this verse from Micah, um, we can assume that, or we assume here at EMU, that peace happens as a process. I think that was named by somebody already, and that the process involves doing. So how do you do justice? Well, here, for example, we have a program on restorative justice that addresses the problem of how do we do justice when harm has happened? Uh, our program, and so that's a master's degree in restorative justice. Our, our master's degree in conflict transformation, for example, addresses the question of how do you do justice in our relationships, our our one-on-one -on -one relationships, our families uh, and small group relationships, but also especially in our social systems and our structures. Um, we, I think Charles maybe already mentioned this idea of dismantling oppression, for example, that that's part of our requirement for engaging in peacemaking. And are we have a leadership program and masters in transformational leadership that addresses the question of how do we lead for justice? And so that's a, an example of that one. So justice, mercy, or kindness, uh, that one, uh, for, for example, um, how do we do those things? We work to meet needs, which might not be included in everyone's peace studies program, or peace building program. We work to offer hospitality to teach processes that can provide for safety, uh, help move us toward dignity, Charles named, well-being for all people, um, offering compassion, uh, non-judgment, and, um, and forgiveness on those steps. And so 
Um, I need to wrap up, but I'll say the last one is around humility, this idea of walking humbly with God. And that humbleness is admitting that we could be wrong, that we don't assume that we have the right or the only way. And that implies that we are willing to learn and grow and change, like as we are asking our students to do. Um, sorry, Naomi, I know I'm over time. Our future work is to continue to support learning, especially toward sustaining the social movements that already exist around nonviolence, justice, compassion, et cetera, and to offer programs from our values base. Thank you. Thank you so much. No apologies needed. You all are who we are looking to hear from today. Thank you. All right, our next um, panelist is Alan F. Weaver. Alan is the Director of Strategic Planning for Mennonite Central Committee, MCC, based in Akron, Pennsylvania. He previously worked in a variety of roles with MCC in the occupied Palestinian territories. He has a PhD in theology from the University of Chicago. Alan is the editor and author of 10 books, including Mapping Exile and Return, Palestinian Dispossession and a Political Theology for a Shared Future from Fortress in 2014, and Service and the Ministry of Reconciliation, a Missiology History of Mennonite Central Committee from Bethel College in 2020. Alan, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Naomi. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. Charles asked me to reflect some about how Mennonite theological values inform Mennonite peace building. Um, I will share three theological values. I'm not sure that they are distinctive or certainly not unique to Mennonites or to even to historic peace churches, but they're certainly ones that I think inform um, the peace building work of Mennonite Central Committee, the relief development and peace building organization that I work for. The first, I'll saw off for three snapshots from MCC's current peace building work around the world. Um, the first um, is from Burundi, um, and it illustrates how God's reconciling spirit is at work within the church, not just within the church in a narrow navel gazing way, but pushing the church to reach out beyond itself to work for peace building within the broader society. In the mid 1990s, the Friends Church, the Quakers in Burundi reached out to MCC asking for MCC workers to be stationed in Burundi to work with the youth to help strengthen the commitment to um, nonviolence among their youth in the face of the civil war that was breaking out in the country. And MCC has continued to work for the past quarter century with the Friends Church in Burundi as it um, creates peace committees in the country that seek to address um, conflicts that arise as People who had left villages during the war for a variety of reasons are now coming back, but now there are people who have moved on to um, their lands. And so these peace committees work at seeking to resolve the land conflicts that arise. Um, I should note that all of the examples I'm sharing here are examples of MCC's partnership with different organizations. MCC, the vast majority of MCC's work globally is done through partnership, both partnership with church and church related organizations, as well as with a wide variety of other organizations. The second snapshot I'll share is from Chad, also in Africa, where MCC works with a Protestant ecumenical organization called Emmet. And for the past um, several years, MCC has supported their efforts to work at interfaith peace building and social cohesion across Chad, bringing together leaders um, from Protestant, Catholic, and Muslim communities, learning from one another about how their scriptures call them as Muslims, as Christians, different types of Christians, to working for peace, for building strong relationships across lines of religious difference. And so um, MCC supports the work here of the church, but of the church in partnership 
with people beyond the church, with Muslims, with people from different Christian traditions seeking to strengthen social cohesion in the face of forces that would um, seek to divide people along religious lines. And the final um, snapshot I'll offer is from Israel, Palestine, um, illustrating um, the conviction that peace building work happens um, in, um, in a, a, along an eschatological horizon, or put you know, more simply that peace building is often a witness to a coming future. Um, as Christians committed to nonviolence and abjuring, rejecting violence, um, Mennonites and other historic peace church um, Christians do not seek to force history into a right outcome, but rather seek to act faithfully um, with the hope and the conviction that creative action for peace in the future points to a coming reality that breaks in into the present. Um, the snapshot here is of an, or an activity um, organized by Zohrot, an Israeli organization that has the motto of remembering the Nakba in Hebrew. The word Nakba is an Arabic word referring to catastrophe and is used to refer to how two thirds of the Palestinian population during the war of 1948 became refugees with a well over 400 villages um, erased from the map. Zohrot organizes return visits um, where Israelis and where possible accompanied by Palestinians visit the site, sites of destroyed Palestinian villages within Israel and point si and post signs in Arabic and in Hebrew naming the stores, the houses, the mosques, the churches that once stood there. Um, and in doing so, it's a remembering of an erased past, but also pointing towards a future of coexistence, of a return to a land that is not dominated by nationalism, that isn't dominated by apartheid-like structures, but is instead a place where Palestinians and Israelis might live together in justice and equality. Um, and so those are the three examples I have, and I look forward to learning from what the other panelists have to share. Thank you, Alan. So next we have Jess Stolfius Buller. So Jess is the Peace Education Coordinator for Mennonite Central Committee US. She has years of domestic and international experience facilitating group dialogue, managing collaborative peace building projects, developing curriculum and training children, youth and adults in skills of conflict transformation, nonviolent organizing, and trauma healing. Just to note that Jess worked in Colombia, South America for close to eight years, engaged in local peace building, community development, and regional networking through a Colombian and a Baptist organization on the Caribbean coast. She has undergraduate degrees in sociology and Bible, religion, philosophy as well as Master of Arts at in a Transformational Leadership through the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University. In her current role, Jess works with churches across the US to teach peace theology, facilitate trainings and create resources for engagement in various aspects of peace building. Jess loves being active, yes, and she coaches high school volleyball, enjoys biking, playing games, making music, creating things, and adores her family. She lives in Goshen, Indiana with her husband, William, and their children, Belen and Moses. Jess, you're welcome. Thank you, Charles. Thanks so much for that introduction. <clears throat> Um, in this current position, I work with uh, churches across the U.S., and so I think the question that I'm kind of reflecting on is, what are local churches doing, and how are local congregations connecting theology and practice in this peace-building work, and how is MCC accompanying that work here in the U.S.? So as I think about 
um, the historic peace churches and the future of the historic peace churches, uh, there are a lot of things that come to mind and I'm going to choose two to reflect on briefly. Um, I think one is that I was really intrigued by uh, Naomi's introduction of the historic peace churches and kind of the reminder of the beginning of the historic peace churches being really gathered around a resistance to war. Um, I think, you know, that's a, it's a big part of the historical position and kind of the the historical understanding of what the peace witness means. And as I engage with churches across the historic peace churches in the US, um, I, I see a desire and a practice of connecting that tradition of conscience objection and anti-militarism with a creation of what we replace those systems of violence and oppression with. Um, how are we building towards transformational justice? How are we imagining alternatives? Um, I think of Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I see churches um, really working to focus on uh, connecting this deep rooted, very historical peace position with a response and interaction with their local context, not just an over there kind of abstract affirmation of an anti-war sentiment, but a recognition of violence in our immediate context and a desire to grow peace witness here in this immediate context. So I think that's one place I'm, I see and experience a lot of churches to be doing this at a local level. Uh, the second thing that I would name is this, uh, kind of foundational concept of working at bridging difference and in a in a space where uh, polarization continues to grow where chasms continue to pull us away from one another i see the historic peace churches working at how we how we bridge that um how do we live into colossians 117 all things hold together in christ how do we live into bridging um, across difference, which is a really foundational um, concept in conflict transformation in general. Uh, and so MCC is doing this work in the US. I see churches doing this. Um, MCC by nature, I think we work at this holding various denominations together in a larger, from a larger Anabaptist tradition in a polarizing context. This is harder and harder. Uh, but I think it's a really important peace witness or witness for the peace churches um, that we offer other denominations. Uh, we have a resource in MCC that we've been working with and have heard a lot of feedback from congregations working at dialogue and reframing how we engage conflict. Historically, um, we have this peace witness of saying we are pacifist, we are anti-war, but at home we do everything possible to avoid conflict, right? So how are we now learning to move towards conflict in healthy ways? Um, MCC is doing this and I see the church is doing this locally. Um, so those are the two, the two pieces that I kind of wanted to highlight as, you know, it, it ends up looking like a lot of different things when you're doing local peace building in your communities. Uh, when I started this job in 2016, I was uh, coming from, coming off of years in Colombia, and I, thought, well, I don't know what, what we need to be doing. I haven't been here, right? And as I, as I toured the country asking congregations, how do you understand the peace witness? You know, the range was just almost unfathomable, right? Like anything social justice is a piece of how we do that peace witness. Um, so I think it looks like a lot of things on the ground, but I see those two uh, foundational concepts kind of guiding the churches that that it is um, a work at bridging difference and it's a work at building towards what we are for, not only uh, what we are against. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our next uh, speaker is Regina Shan Stoltzfus, who currently teaches at Goshen College and chairs the Religion, Justice and Society Department. She is co-founder with Tobin Miller Shearer of the Roots of Justice Anti-Oppression Program, formerly Damascus Road Anti-Racism Program. 
She and Tobin are the co-authors of the new book, Ben in the Struggle, Pursuing an Anti-Racist Spirituality from Herald Press in 2021. Regina teaches in the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies and also Bible, Religion, and Philosophy departments. Her courses include Race, Class, and Ethnic Relations, Personal Violence and Healing, Spiritual Path of the Peacemaker, and Transforming Conflict and Violence. Regina has worked in peace education with Ohio Conference of the Mennonite Church, Mennonite Central Committee US, and Mennonite Mission Network. She holds a Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Ashland Theological Seminary and a PhD in Theology and Ethics from Chicago Theological Seminary. Regina is the recipient of the State of Indiana's 2016 Spirit of Justice Award, the highest award conferred by Indiana's Civil Rights Commission, and is the 2021 recipient of the Everence Journey Award. Dr. Shan Stoltzfus, thank you. Thank you so much. It is really good to be here and to hear uh, from colleagues near and far. One of the things that I'll just uh, tack on to what, what one of the things Jess just said, in peace studies, it really is true that everything can be part of the conversation. And that is part of the, the joy and the struggle for me, particularly working with undergrads who come in from a variety of contexts and experiences and working for us to have a cohesive semester long conversation around issues of justice, of peace building. Um, and so that's, that is the primary thing that I think about in terms of the questions that we're bringing to this conversation. And the phrase context matters is one that I say a lot in the classroom. And as I look at the kind of work that I've been drawn to and, um, and have worked with in a variety of places over a number of years, I see that context matters for the way that I was nurtured and shaped in the Mennonite church, the church of my upbringing. In Cleveland, Ohio, I went to from a tiny child on up to adulthood in a, um, in a congregation that was intentionally interracial, primarily black and white from its very beginning. And it was started as a small fellowship from some white Mennonite folks in Ohio and other places who had come to Cleveland as they did to many urban centers across the country as part of alternative service that we heard about in the introduction to the panel today. And so that's that was the beginning of my context being um, taught about God and the universe and our, our human relationships with one another and with the divine and with the earth in a place that was Anabaptist peace theology and also very racially conscious and in the context of um, the, the last decade or so of what we recognize as the civil rights movement, even though I would say that that movement is still going on. And so growing up, in church, having conversations about race, about justice, about injustice, really shaped me into a person that was very comfortable talking and thinking about race. And that is a big part of what I've done in the organizations that I've worked for. And I continue to do, as I teach in the Peace, Justice and Conflict Studies, I use the lens of race as a way of thinking about systems and structures and structural oppression. And, um, and that is what is on the minds of lots of people. It's not new, it's, this is conversation in um, the US with our racialized history for many, 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 many years. But the reiterations of that conversation uh, seem to bring it to the surface um, every generation. And so as I have conversations and teach and learn from my students, it is, it seems like it is, it's, it's never old to talk about, but the uh, paradox of that is, it is something that, again, we are witnessing challenges to thinking about talking about race as something that is inappropriate for us to do as human beings, 
something that is inappropriate for us to do as Christians. I'm speaking uh, broadly speaking. And so that is a current challenge that I think about. Um, and even as I say that it's a new kind of uh, challenge in this generation, in many ways it's not. Uh, over three decades of doing anti-racism work primarily with Christian communities, primarily in especially the first 15 or 20 years with Mennonite communities being told um, from a number of voices and places that it's either not an appropriate conversation or racism is over and so there's really nothing to talk about uh, or just putting up um, putting up blocks to talking about it because it is a conflict longstanding, injustice longstanding that makes people uncomfortable to talk about. So if I think about the question of what is it that I would want to have more uh, conversation, more ability, more capacity to have these conversations as we build towards a more just society, more just structures in all kinds of ways, not just uh, thinking about race, but looking at that particular lens as a way of thinking about other things as well. That is something that I long for more, less conflict about even having the conversation. Um, there are many people who are willing and able and have been in this conversation, but it continues to be a different kind of struggle, it seems almost every few years. Um, but that I have lots of colleagues that I value and I do see many contributions coming into this conversation, feeding both in the academic side and uh, in the practice of peace building in our churches and beyond. Thanks very much. Thank you, Regina. So next, we're gonna be hearing from Nathan Hosler. Uh, he is the director of the Church of the Brethren's Office of Peace Building and Policy based out in Washington, DC. And he is a pastor at the Washington City Church of the Brethren Congregation on, on the Capitol Hill. Previously, he served as the Ecumenical Peace Coordinator of the National Council of Churches, USA, as well as worked with the peace program of Ecclesia Yamwar and Nigeria, which is Church of the Brethren in Nigeria, and then taught, taught peace building practice and theology at Culp Bible College in Northeastern Nigeria from 2009 to 2011. Nathan Hosler convinced the DC based Nigeria Working Group, uh, which I'm a co chair with and then works on US foreign policy, drone warfare, racial justice, statelessness, environmental issues, and food security. He holds a BA in biblical language, MA in international relations, focusing on religion and peace building, and a PhD in theological studies, working in theological ethics, focusing on peacemaking. Nathan, you're welcome. Thank you, Charles. It's good to see you, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in our Nigeria Working Group meeting. Um, as noted, I'm, I'm based in D.C. in the Washington City Church of Brethren, where I'm presently. Uh, the church building sits on the land of the historic and present-day Anacostan and Piscataway peoples, so we recognize that. I note this um, because it highlights a, an interesting dynamic of doing work as a historic peace church. Uh, the church of Brethren has had a representative on and off um, since the 1940s doing work in relation to US policy, um, but also the complication of, of, of doing this in, in, in line in, in present communities as, as well as in light of uh, and in relationship with communities around the world. One, one nagging question that I uh, maybe one day will find the answer to is um, the location of this particular church. Uh, we're based about four blocks from the from the Capitol building. So when the leaves are off the tree, I can see just the top of the Capitol building. I'm out my window. And I the question that I that comes to me is, is, is this uh, because we bought into the assumptions of power, or is it because we're here taking up space and political space and representing in a way that challenges that that very power? Um, I imagine it's probably a bit of both, um, but it is one that we live in tension with. 
the three kind of buckets of areas I'm gonna focus on in our work is uh, one, the broad ones around policy advocacy. Um, the second is network building. And the third is the practice of theology. I'm starting with the network um, building. You, you saw this in the, in the bio, um, all of our work is in relation to and with other faith communities, interfaith communities, and the broader NGO and US government um, space, uh, which both um, creates many opportunities as well as many challenges. Um, this work of doing the work, say, to address US policy is itself, I see, part of peace building. We learn from others. We learn from um, many Catholic groups, for example, that do very important work on nonviolence. Uh, working at the, the Vatican, for example, would be more directly engaged in nonviolence. Uh, on, the, on the policy end, uh, and this also then, of course, goes to our theology and this theology as theory and towards action. Um, so, for example, the Church of Southern has policy that says all war is sin, and we work, as was noted earlier, on issue of drone warfare. And so we have a very distinct and specific and theologically robust statement, all war is sin. And then we're going to go and, and work to address the, the, the policies and practice of uh, US drone warfare, specifically lethal drone warfare and the associated pieces. And so this, this it's not simply a translation, but it's uh, using this uh, theology, which is resistant to war to both change and mitigate the harms by US policy. And so you know, I'm not gonna get a, 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 you know, any legislation that, you know, that accepts Church of the Brethren theology, but there are ways where we can work um, to both highlight the voices of targeted communities, as well as um, mitigate the harm of this policy. So it's, it's a bit of tension or dynamic play between um, this theology and finding. So for example, the one policy we're working on is getting CIA, uh, getting drone strikes out of the CIA into the Department of Defense, which sounds on, on face, like it's asking for more um, drone strikes from the Department of Defense. In theoretical practice, this at least has the possibility for greater transparency, which then allows for greater resistance from the broader population to, to slow down the use of drones. And so we take this very dramatic statement of all war sin, and we will not participate or, or benefit from or uh, uh, allow war to happen, and then work to find very specific ways that mitigate this, the harm caused by this. The other is, I, the a bit of dynamic play between this theological statements and the um, partners on the grounds, as we often say in DC, our, our international partners or domestic partners uh, in targeted communities. And so, as was noted, my, my first work was with the Church of the Brethren in Nigeria. We arrived a month after the first um, Boko Haram attacks, and within a week um, was in classroom um, looking at New Testament teaching uh, on peace and, and working to develop curriculum on this. And this this raises uh, you know, a number of uh, very difficult questions clearly, and I didn't assume and I still don't assume to have the answers to these very difficult questions. But what, it, what this does do is, is challenge um, in a context of severe insecurity, how do we enact policies and practices and, and skills for peace building um, that are both theologically truthful and in line with our discerned understanding over the years but also prioritize vulnerable and targeted communities that are experiencing severe violence. And um, you know, the, the, the standard answer is that we, we uh, in DC at least, is that you use violence to combat violence, especially when it's unprincipled or seems to be unprincipled violence such as Boko Haram. Um, but this, this raises a number of questions um, and we will hopefully have a chance to dig into these a bit more um, as we continue on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. I would like to, it's hard for me to multitask, I apologize. I'm gonna introduce Rebecca Dali, who is here with her uh, spouse, Samuel, and they are um, uh, really very glad that they are joining us today. Rebecca Dali is the founder and executive director of Sisepi. And I should have asked, is it Sisepi or just Sepi? I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways, either way. Uh, the Center for Caring, Empowerment, and Peace Initiatives, established in 1989. Sisepi is a registered nonprofit organization in both Nigeria and the United States, and it provides care and aid to the most vulnerable persons who have been affected by disaster, violence, trauma, and devastation in many forms, including girls and women who have escaped from Boko Haram. 
Over 2 million people in Nigeria have been served by SESEPI. Rebecca has received multiple awards as a peace advocate and humanitarian actor, including recognition by the UN. In addition to her peace building leadership, Dr. Dali is a scholar and an author. She has multiple degrees, including a PhD from the University of Jos, and is the author of seven books and more than 10 articles. She has served as a scholar in residence at Elizabethtown College and Bridgewater College, and she has been lecturer and senior lecturer at the Theological College of Northern Nigeria, as well as Culp Theological Seminary. Rebecca's emphasis in her programming and teaching is on a minimization of conflict, peaceful coexistence, and the importance of mutuality and interdependence. She dreams of a Nigeria where all people can live in peace and prosperity. Rebecca. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, great uh, introduction. And uh, you have already uh, said it all about me. And I thank you. So uh, my work has been influenced by my personal history. Uh, my, my great grandfather was uh, uh, the slave trade took him and then uh, we, my, my mother, told us about the sad history and he has no close relative. And from there, we, 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 we live in poverty and uh, the story scared me because uh, uh, to, to have someone been taken away, snatched uh, from the community is very scary. And because of the poverty, I was also raped. And uh, my son got lost because of the violent and my niece. So I'm in between. And also my research, I did my PhD uh, in violent against women. So I interviewed thousands of women who saw who show me a lot of uh, things and they shared their horrible uh, stories. And some they saw, they, they show me how part of their body was mutilated. So uh, I, I got sponsorship from Church of the Brethren and then uh, gradually I, I started serving these numerous women and uh, the survivals of rape and the, the violence. And we are in the middle of the violence now in Jos. Every minute, there will be a news of kidnapping and all this. So I have uh, my program, uh, immediate, acute immediate need, that is food and nutrition, shelter, house, housing, access, uh, assignment, uh, uh, assistant and then health and water. And I have to long time needs for building resilience and rebuilding community, like trauma healing, reintegration of women and girls who are adopted by Boko Haram or who came out from kidnapping. And then we have skill, skills uh, center, agriculture and livelihood and uh, a lot of things. So our, our beneficiaries are mostly the women and the children and uh, the, the families of those who were killed. So we, we provide uh, food, a non-food item, as I said, and uh, I attend to the Chibok parents, uh, and uh, cancel them because I too, my son got lost. Today is 11 years. I don't know whether he's dead or alive. So we, wore the, we are wearing the same shoes with them. And uh, so uh, uh, my work uh, is uh, really sometimes is very scary. I was uh, kidnapped by Boko Haram one time 
and they let me go because they said that I've been serving both Christian and Muslims. And uh, the church, Church of the Brethren and my church, uh, I, I was really groomed since when I was a, a child uh, in girls' brigade and in Sunday school and about peace. So I invited both Christian and Muslim to enjoy everything that uh, we do. And some, because of the witness without preaching, they accepted Christ as their Lord and personal savior. And uh, the award that I received, I was just doing it, but people notice it and uh, is to the glory and honor of God. So I am very grateful to be here. And uh, I thank you very much for allowing me to participate and share. And I'm happy to meet with uh, Nathan, Charles, and uh, all the people that they are now, uh, they are new to me, but now we are together. Thank you for my husband who is uh, supporting me always. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Rebecca. Thank you, Mama Namu. Uh, so uh, <laughs> next, next is, Matt Gain. So Matt is the director of church and community organizing with On Earth Peace, the peace and justice agency of the Church of the Brethren in the United States. Matt is a co a, a co-founder of the Kingian Nonviolence Coordinating Committee and a facilitator with the Social Change Training Center, Training for Change. Matt is a graduate of Bethany Theological Seminary the University of Notre Dame and Manchester University, Indiana. He lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife, Sarah Kinsel and their two sons. Matt, you're welcome. Good. Great. Okay. This has been an amazing panel so far. And I kind of would like to sit and listen to the people who've already spoken, talk some more, but I agreed that I would say something too. So I'm gonna add a little bit to the conversation and then we'll keep moving. Um, I work with the Peace and Justice Agency of the Church of the Brethren in the United States, which is called On Earth Peace. On Earth Peace was founded in 1974 by 20th century peace leader, M.R. Ziegler. Um, and I'm gonna say a little bit more about On Earth Peace in a moment, um, but I wanted to share that I was raised in the Church of the Brethren and I learned that following Jesus is a countercultural commitment of costly love. Um, the search for how to live out that commitment and follow Jesus' teachings in my everyday life led me to commit my life to the practice of learning and teaching nonviolence. In the course of uh, my path, that has included working with Honor and Peace. Now I'm starting my third decade and working with Training for Change, which is founded by Quaker peace and nonviolence activist George Lakey, and working with Christian peacemaker teams, now known as community peacemaker teams. Um, this has been a rich panel, and I'm going to reflect a little bit about the work of On Earth Peace and share three hopes for historic peace church practice. Um, so, over our 47 year history, On Earth Peace has provided a variety of programs, starting from our inception, um, during and at the tail end of the Vietnam War, with a commitment to youth and young adult leadership development, particularly as conscientious objectors, um, offering peace retreats where youth learned to be peace promoters or faithful global citizens, um, a long period of working, developing conflict transformation resources and leadership in the Church of the Brethren, and working on specific issues from the death penalty to many justice areas, racial justice, militarism, LGBTQ plus justice, Palestine, gender and women's justice, environmental justice. Um, it bears mentioning that we've been at odds with our mother tradition in the last decade or so due to our commitment to LGBTQ plus inclusion, as well as to our work on racial justice advocacy. We're presently making an intervention in our own practice 
at On Earth Peace. We've observed that nearly five decades in, we have a comfort zone um, of what it's easiest for us to do, which is education. And that education by itself doesn't lead to the outcomes that we yearn for, that we teach about, and that we pray for. So we're challenging ourselves to lean into organizing people to take clear public action related to issues of violence and injustice, rather than just telling people what's going on with the latest injustice or area of violence. Right now, we're re-strategizing to help our interns and staff work together to use organizing and mobilizing approaches to move our constituency rather than just holding webinars to educate and build community. In the present moment of the war in Ukraine, we're developing new accountability to invite our people to step in and step up in recognizable, clear ways related to war in the global context and the militarization of policing here in the United States. A main focus of Honor's Peace today is training, leadership development, and organizing informed by an approach called Kingian nonviolence. Kingian nonviolence is a values-rooted philosophy and methodology coming from the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights and Freedom Movement. David Jensen, a member of the Church of the Brethren was on the Chicago Project staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And after Dr. King's assassination, Jensen worked with Bernard Lafayette Jr. to create an approach and a curriculum that teaches values and practices for conflict and community leadership. This year, On Earth Peace launched a project to train 1,000 members or friends of the Church of the Brethren in Kingia nonviolence. The outcome that we seek is not just training these people and making them better people. The outcome that we seek is to foster teams working in an ongoing way, um, intentionally using the discipline of nonviolence on a variety of topics that they might identify. Here are uh, three points that I'd like to offer um, in terms of a vision for Historic Peace Church. Uh, practice related to peace building. Um, let's see, I'm going to put them in the chat. I'm also going to put links to our values and mission and to our paid internships for college and graduate students. Spread the word. Um, but here are the three points. First of all, I would like to see the Church of the Brethren and other historic peace churches, if this applies to you, um, deepen our spiritual roots and wells. Um, the image I offer is the deepening the roots. When you think about how roots grow in the garden and roots grow deeper and fatter, able to sustain the growth of the plant, or fresh water springing up to nourish the work. As Christ following peace builders, let us commit to creating and recommitting to spiritual practices and theological and scriptural perspectives that can nourish, heal, and propel us into active peace building. So this is not just teaching about peace or praying for peace. I'm talking about something um, different. Um, second, clarify which peace we are working for. Um, Dr. King has a sermon that I commend to you called When Peace Becomes Obnoxious. Short sermon in which he talks about the difference between negative and positive peace, which many other people have also worked on. He calls a peace that just represses conflict. He calls that the peace that stinks in the nostrils of the almighty God. And I would say that there's a kind of a fetishization of, of negative peace in the peace church traditions. And I appreciate the way that my um, fellow panelists have already put that before us. But um, I wish that we would renew and deepen our commitment to oppose war and all violence, not just war over there, which not all share in our traditions. All of us here who are professionals agree, but not all people in our traditions share that. So we've got to say we must oppose war and violence, but also to transcend that, that peace must be more than resisting war or seeking calm. A ceasefire does not uh, address does not resolve the underlying issues. 
for honor is peace that has meant intentionally claiming a positive peace, um, a positive peace as one of our core values. And we say that means committing to dynamic forms of peacemaking that seek conflict as an important tool to meet needs, to address injustice, uh, to correct imbalances of power, and to seek healing and reconciliation. Finally, uh, my third hope is that we institutionalize shared practices and frameworks of peacemaking and nonviolence. So statements and confessions, which Nate relies on in his work with the Washington office, the Office on Peacebuilding and Policy, they're important and they're only a starting point and will never by themselves transform situations where harm is happening. So what are the shared disciplines and practices, spiritual, ongoing, organizing nonviolence and conflict that we can lift up, that we can share, and that we can talk shop about how we're doing this and not just what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And our last, but definitely not least speaker. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not finding the, ah, there we go. Sarah Clark. Sarah Clark joins us as the, the sole Quaker panelist, specifically Quaker panelist. Sarah Clark serves as the director of the Quaker UN office in New York. In this capacity, she leads CUNO's engagement with the UN, diplomats, and civil society representatives, bringing Quaker practice and insights to the work of the UN. Originally from Canada, Sarah is a member of Canadian Yearly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends. She has worked in the field of peacebuilding and conflict transformation for over 20 years, having previously served as Quaker representative at CUNO and having worked with a variety of peacebuilding actors in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Good afternoon, friends. And certainly I wanna begin by extending my heartfelt thanks to Naomi and to Charles for convening this fabulous conversation as well as to my fellow panelists from whom I've already uh, learned so much. I think uh, to understand the peace tradition of Quakers, it's important to start with a little bit of Quaker history. Um, and I think as Naomi sort of outlined um, that Quakerism emerged during the 1600s as a reaction to contradictions in the established Church of England. And George Fox advocated that it is possible for the divine to speak to each of us. Um, and as such, it was not necessary to have a priest or a pastor serve as an intermediary. Uh, the peace testimony among friends then has really emerged um, based on the belief that there is that of the divine in all humans. And of course, this forbids us from killing one another. And this has really led then Quakers to take a strong stand against war and to heed the call from George Fox to live in the virtue of that life and power that takes away the occasion of all wars. In living out the peace testimony, there have been a variety of peacemaking efforts that Quakers have led over the past centuries. Also, there's been a significant tradition around humanitarian efforts. Uh, and in 1947, Quakers in the US and the UK were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for humanitarian relief efforts that were conducted in Europe following the Second World War. In 1948, the Friends World Committee for Consultation became one of the first um, non-governmental NGOs right, to become accredited at the newly formed United Nations. So as a result, today we have a Quaker office in, uh, at the UN in New York and a Quaker office in Geneva. And those offices have been in place and doing work for the past 75 years. Um, and it's really been this presence of the Quaker offices and the use of Quaker houses in both locations as a place to convene quiet diplomatic conversations um, that really reflects the long support that Quakers have had for the multilateral system and a belief that countries should solve disputes through dialogue. 
and or in the words of George Fox, should deny all outward wars and strife and fighting with outward weapons. So indeed, this really this work has been uh, an illustration of the long term commitment of Quakers to strive to take away the occasion of all wars. Quaker's work at the UN, or sorry, Quaker work at the UN has also been done in parallel with Quaker service agencies and Quaker communities carrying out efforts on the ground in a variety of different settings around the world. Uh, from the UN, our offices have often engaged with Quaker communities in uh, the African Great Lakes region. Quakers have had a long commitment to supporting peace building work in Southeast Asia and have stood in solidarity with communities in Latin America. Um, Quakers have long uh, supported engagement with peace advocates in the Middle, e Middle East. And certainly in the US, Quakers focus on issues related to justice and uh, migration reform. Over recent months, uh, Quakers have found themselves deeply challenged by the eruption of crisis and conflict in Ukraine. I know that at our office, we have received many calls uh, and have heard the expression of a really deep desire for some kind of a Quaker response, but have felt um, really challenged in identifying what that response could be. Um, this has really, for in, in my view, has really been an occasion when Quakers have had to struggle with the reality that once a conflict erupts with kinetic force, our opportunities for engagement are severely limited. So in situations where, uh, like this, we are really forced to reconcile ourselves to the reality that in living out the Quaker peace testimony, there is no quick fix in a crisis situation. However unsatisfying this conclusion may be, it forces us to return to our focus on long-term efforts where we can add value. And so many in the Quaker world have leaned into um, forms of engagement where we have something to offer, for instance, um, a focus on humanitarian assistance or uh, that, you know, that very important work of sowing seeds of reconciliation for the long term. So really, this is just a very quick overview and snapshot of one particular moment in, um, in the challenges that we face as Quakers doing work at the UN, um, but also in ways in which the Quaker uh, community is challenged more broadly as we continue to grapple with what it really means to be a, a peace church. Thanks so much. Thank you. I am going to remove the spotlight, but for some of you, it may still show uh, a large image. If you, like me, prefer to see the entire group who is gathered, if you go to the top right corner of your screen where it says view and select gallery, that should bring you back to a window where you can see everyone who is present. So um, this has been fantastic. I am so very grateful to all of the panelists who have joined us and brought um, really a diverse perspective um, of the, the, the wide variety of work that you are all involved in. And I am particularly impressed by and thinking about the fantastic blend of academic thought and scholarly study with practical action. And I see each of you engaging in both of those uh, in really important and valuable ways. So thank you so much for the time that you have spent to be here with us this afternoon. Um, I did see a couple of questions in the chat, so I would like to direct our attention to those. And I would encourage if any others who are present have questions or comments, you are welcome to put them in the chat. Panelists are welcome to, to direct questions or comments as well. And there can be conversation going there that may be separate. Um, we have about just under 10 minutes remaining, so I want to make sure we have time to, to chat. Um, there, has, uh, there was a question from Martin, and Martin, I don't know if you would like to unmute and ask your question. If not, I'm happy to ask it on your behalf, if Martin is still here. Yes, I'm here, but you can go ahead. Okay. So Martin's question is very timely, which is pertinent to the war in Ukraine. 
And uh, Martin asks, uh, considering the anti-war disposition of the historic peace churches, what would be the advice to the Ukrainians? And I would say any panelists who feel uh, that they have a thought to contribute to that, feel free to unmute and, and go ahead. I would say that from the Mennonite perspective that even uh, Mennonites are divided on the answer to that. Um, even in my own church, which is a fairly progressive one, there was a debate, um, there's been kind of a debate around the last couple of weeks about, you know, do we support, um, you know, do we, do we want to support, um, how, how do we do that? How do we support Ukrainians? How do we talk about the Russian invasion? How do we, an invasion or what do we call it? And um, you know, there are some calls for some Mennonites to support arming the, the Ukrainians. And so sort of where are we? And there, there's a real diversity, I think. And also to add uh, to this, you know, the Ukrainian, they're in very difficult uh, position. Uh, in Nigeria, a lot of uh, people, churches are saying, let us take arm and uh, go and fight. But uh, as a church of the brethren, we try to, to say, no, there is uh, two wrongs will never make a right. But you know, if you are pushed the wall, if someone come in front of your uh, door with gun, what can you do? You have to defend yourself. So they are in very, very difficult position. And uh, I pity them as I pity myself too here in Nigeria. I was gonna say you have a unique and valuable perspective on that. Rebecca and Samuel. So, uh, so Naomi, uh, let me just add that uh, the reality is that we are faced with an ethical and moral dilemma at this moment in time. Yeah, uh, and um, dilemma in the sense that we are faced with, uh, with the raw authenticity of our faith calling, non-violence, you know, and then and then also first with the fact that the world is changing and we have diverse perspectives as regards to responding to violence and conflict. And so to some extent, there is this, there is this perspective or this view as uh, on, uh, on, um, um, justified moment for reaction. I mean, which you can uh, uh, call the, the, um, the, what do you call it? The, um, the um, sorry, is blinking now, but, but however, there is no justification actually to respond to violence. And so the issue of whether I'm right or wrong, most times, as we know, core in the scriptures does not even arise than for us to just be sacrificial in nature, but again, the reality is still, still, uh, still plays out. We have life to save, but how do we best save this life? You know. So, uh, just as I said, it's 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 a moral and ethical dilemma. So we have to non-violently save lives, and we have to non-violently disrupt the system and and the structures, especially the global system that tends to that tends to, to display some kind of uh, complicity at this moment in time. So, and I remember what Matt said about not only educating people, not only training people, but, but also, I mean, making sure that action is made actionable. Thank you. I'm mindful of the time, but I did want to make sure we have an opportunity to, to address Dan's question as well. Dan, would you like to share your question or would you like for me to read it? Please go ahead and read it. Thank okay. you. 
So Dan asks, how are historic peace churches in the United States working for peace in the context of social and political polarization and culture war issues in our context in the United States, especially since these denominations are often polarized and even fractured in conflicts in themselves, I think is the, is the suggestion um, that, that Dan is making that parallel those in larger culture. And Matt alluded to this a bit in his comments about tension between peace building organizations and inclusivity and denominational stances for lack of a better word. Any thoughts or comments relating to that question? I would say that uh, from the Mennonite related Anabaptist churches that um, I see, I think there has been and, and is a, a bit of an awakening of a self-recognition that, that we are mimicking culture in this. Um, I think perhaps there's been a, a, a sense that, a false sense that we, we didn't in the past, um, that we did model something different. And I think in recent years, there's, there's been some awakening around that. And so I think there's, I, I see the work happening turned internally with local congregations at least recognizing and kind of learning to do the practice uh, in in a pretty small space. I would also say at MCC that's a piece of what we're doing, what we're really intentionally working at as we are kind of a big tent organization holding a number of Anabaptist uh, denominations, really working at trying to keep holding them together and, and uh, recognizing the intentionality that that takes and um, the importance of being able to do that kind of bridging in a context that is so polarized. So um, yeah, that's one thing I'd add. I'm going to just break in and say that I recognize it is five o'clock, which is our agreed ending time. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Having said that, I am not in a rush and I am happy to keep this Zoom open longer for those who might like to have continued conversation, but I understand that some will need to go. So let me just offer a word of conclusion in that we are so appreciative of, of your time today, all of you who have come to listen and participate and share. And it was optimistic to think we could do this all in one hour and 30 minutes and perhaps we need a day or a week or a lifetime. But thank you so much for being here. And again, I'm happy to stay uh, if there is continued conversation that people would like to have.